Okay, we are live. Good evening, everyone, committee members, applicants, agents, anyone watching from home. Uh, welcome to the Committee of Adjustment for October 7th, the City of Brantford. I'll just start this evening uh, reading some, some uh, procedures regards to this meeting format. And then we'll take attendance and then I will read some more procedures that are more standard to, uh, to how the meeting is run itself. So I'll just start. Uh, good evening, members of the committee and members of the public. I'll now call the Committee of Adjustment to order as this meeting is held electronically due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I will go over some rules procedures for the benefit of the members and the viewing public. This meeting is held or is being streamed live via the city of Brantford YouTube account. All members of the committee will be muted until uh, muted upon entering the meeting and throughout when they are not speaking in order to reduce background noise. All uh, web cameras for the committee of members shall be turned on throughout the meeting. If a member needs to leave their seat, please leave the camera on so that we recognize that you are away. Staff will be requested to join the video meeting should they need to answer any questions of any members. Any member of the committee participating shall indicate that they wish to speak or ask questions by pressing the digital raised hand button on the participant list screen. Your hand will stay raised until you are called upon and staff will lower your hand when you have been called on by the chair. Uh, movers and seconders of motion shall be indicated by raising your hand on the camera and the chair will call out who the mover and seconder are. All members of the committee participating via online video conference will vote by a physical show of hands. A recorded vote will be taken by the clerk. Applicants, agents, owners, and delegations are participating via Zoom or telephone accordingly. All persons wishing to speak to the items on the agenda this evening were required to register by 9 a.m. of today. Uh, any delegations re uh, received in written format have been provided to the members of the committee and will form part of the meeting record. In the event that a connection service interruption occurs uh, that affects quorum of the committee, uh, we may recess the meeting for up to 15 minutes in order to allow uh, the meeting to regain quorum. If quorum is not achieved, the meeting is adjourned. So I'll ask the clerk to uh, take a roll call. Virginia Kershaw. Here. Tara Gaskin. Here. Lee Reiner. Here. Greg Kempa. Here. Dan Nemizniak. Present. So I'll ask at this time if any members of the committee have any conflict of interest for any of the items this evening. Okay, seeing none, I will now uh, just read out our standard procedures for the, for the public, uh, public meeting this evening. So this meeting is held in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. The purpose of this meeting is to discuss minor variance consent and severance applications and to give members of the public an opportunity to ask questions, express concerns or provide comment either in support or against the application. Each hearing is generally dealt with in accordance with the order that they appear on the agenda. In the event that the hearing is not completed on this date, it will be adjourned to a later date at which uh, time the committee may hear further submissions. At the conclusion of each hearing, this committee will make a decision on each application. The names of those individuals who speak on any item tonight will appear within the meeting minutes. Anyone wishing to uh, wishing further notice or wishing to receive uh, further notice of the hearing, including a copy of the committee's decision, please contact uh, the city's clerk department. Minor variance decisions are final if there are no appeals 20 days after the committee's dis decision and consent decisions are final if there are no appeals 20 days after the notice of the decision has been issued. Tonight's order of delegations will be as follows. We will have the applicant or agent uh, present the details of their, uh, of their application, followed by some questions and comments uh, from the committee to the applicant or agent. And then we'll have staff present the details of the staff report and staff recommendation followed by questions. 
will then open the, the meeting to uh, members of the public, any members who are present that wish to speak on that particular item, that will be their opportunity to, to voice their concerns. Uh, we'll have questions of clarification from the committee to the members of the public. Uh, once the public portion is closed, we'll allow the committee to ask any items of clar clarification from the applicant uh, or staff. This will also be an opportunity for the applicant or agent to provide clarification on any items that were discussed during that public portion. So with that being said, we, uh, we have a number of items on our agenda this evening. We'll get right to it. Uh, our first item on the agenda is a minor variance application, A15-2020. Uh, is the applicant present? I do believe our applicant is is with us uh, by phone only. So if he is muted, I'll make sure to remind him if he wishes to be heard, he'll have to unmute himself. Mr. Talos, if, if you're on your phone and you press star six, it should unmute yourself. Okay, so while we give uh, the applicant an opportunity to, to try to unmute himself, how about we move forward with uh, the staff presentation just to allow some time for our, perhaps our clerks can reach out to, to the applicant to sort out the technical difficulties. So I'll, uh, I'll invite staff to come in and uh, provide the presentation of the staff report and recommendation. Okay, thank you, Chair um, and members of the committee. So this is a minor variance application for 15 Winarden Court and 79 Buffalo Street. It is one property, just has two addresses. Next slide, please. The applicant is proposing to construct a detached garage on the property with an area of 279 square meters and to facilitate this development as proposed, the applicant is seeking relief from section 6.3.1.2.1 of the bylaw to permit a maximum height of an accessory building of 7.3 meters, whereas a maximum height of 7.5 meters is typically permitted. The property is designated residential area low density in the official plan and zoned residential conversion zone. The property is located between Winarden Court to the west and Buffalo Street to the east. The main access is off of Buffalo Street um, and then there is no access off of Wooden Arden Court. The property slopes downward with the higher elevation to the north and slopes down to the south. And the property is surrounded by residential uses. The CN rail corridor is approximately 65 meters to the south. And there is a car collision repair service across the street at the corner of Rushton and Buffalo Street. The property currently contains an old dwelling, which is um, named Winarden Castle. This property is subject to a heritage easement through the Ontario Heritage Trust. And the property also contains an existing detached garage and an existing legal non-conforming dwelling. So the proposed building would make a total of four buildings on the property. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the site plan. The proposed building is the gray square in the middle, um, and then the existing house and the existing storage are existing. Next slide. So the applicant, 
we circulated the application to all departments and agencies and no adverse comments or objections were received. We received comments from the Ontario Heritage Trust and they advise that they have no concerns with this variance as there are minimal impacts to the views to and from Winarden Castle. We also circulated the application to the notice of public hearing, sorry, by personal mail and by posting a sign on the site. Um, at the date of preparing the report and since that date, we have heard from three residents and they all had clarification questions regarding the location of the proposed detached garage um, and the, the residents were uh, provided clarification on that. Next slide, please. So this is the location where the proposed detached garage um, is proposed. Um, the subject lands as stated are de designated residential area low density. And this designation permits a variety of low density residential type dwellings, including semi-detached, single detached, duplex and triplex and accessory structures. And the minor variance conforms to the official plan. The zoning on the property is residential conversion zone. The zone permits accessory buildings, but the accessory buildings are not permitted to be used for human habitation. The RC zone does not permit accessory, accessory dwelling units in these accessory buildings. The proposed accessory building will be used for parking and storage and is therefore a permitted use. The intent of the height restriction for accessory structures in the zoning bylaw is to, re to reduce the potential for overlook and privacy concerns and foreshadowing and to control the mass and built form of accessory structures onto neighboring residential properties. The request for the increase in height is in order to accommodate a second story for storage and to repurpose large antique stained glass windows from a former Brantford place of worship. These windows will complement the historic architecture of the existing principal building, which is Winarden Castle. The proposed height of 7.3 meters is the same height as the existing dwelling on the property, which can be seen in the next slide. Um, so the proposed detached garage will be the same height as that dwelling. This dwelling is located closer to the Buffalo Street frontage, and therefore the proposed height will have a similar impact as the existing dwelling. And in addition, the proposed detached garage is further away from the adjacent properties and there is existing mature veg vegetation, which will effectively mitigate any potential impacts from the increase in height. In staff's opinion, there are no ne negative impacts to adjacent properties and the intent of the official plan and zoning bylaw are maintained and the variance is considered minor and appropriate for the development of the lands. For the reasons mentioned above, the minor variance satisfies the criteria of section 45.1 of the Planning Act and staff recommend that application A15-2020 be approved. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll ask at this time if the committee members have any questions of staff. I think we are still working on on uh, on having the applicant connect. Um, but Lee, you have a question? Yes, through you, Chair. There's a just two questions. Sorry, uh, the proposal is 7.3 meters in height, but looking at the um, Ontario Heritage Trust comments, it says 7 7.2. As opposed to 7.3, I don't know if, the, is that a concern? Does that make a difference? Uh, through the chair, that was basically a discrepancy um, through the, um, with the Ontario Heritage Trust. So they got that number from the variant. So it was just a small, a small issue, but they, they are fine with the 7.3. It was just a, a myth. Basically, they just got the wrong number, but they had based it off of the, the variance. Hello? That, that letter can be revised to say 7.3. Steve, is that you? I heard Steve. Hello, can you hear me? Steve, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, we were having problems with my son's cell phone, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, since we have you, I'll put the staff comments on hold if that's okay. And I'll, uh, okay, I'll, let, you, I'll let you have the floor. Okay, um, what would you like me to do? Just give a basic outline of uh, my project? That's right, so at this point we have had staff present the details of the report and the details of the, okay. of the request. 
Um, I'll just right. mention as well that, that we do have uh, a copy of your letter that you provided the committee. Um, we should have that. Okay, here. so I don't have to go into too much detail then. That's right. And we do have, uh, obviously, the visuals that were provided with the application. Oh, too. that's so great. Any additional information that you would like to provide, uh, now is your opportunity. Um, all I'd like to say is that the uh, existing structure that is going to go up there is a, a close facsimile to what the original coach house used to look like. And um, earlier this summer, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to acquire all of the stained glass windows from St. Jude's Church, which had formerly been uh, declared a national historic site, but uh, was unfortunately converted to condominiums and they removed all of the stained glass windows. Uh, I was also able to acquire all of the um, memorial plaques, the bronze memorial plaques. And uh, as I stated in my letter, <clears throat> I'm a historian and um, I thought it uh, most unfortunate to see all of these stained glass windows leave Brantford and so consequently, my objective is to uh, take all of those stained glass windows and incorporate them inside of my building. Now, they're not going to be on the outside. They're actually going to be on the inside uh, with, um, with lighting behind them. And uh, so consequently, the building uh, needs additional height. Now, the additional height uh, is to conform with the uh, part of the original coach house that was there. So, uh, as I indicated, uh, it's just a question of uh, increasing the height from 4.5 meters, I believe, to 7.3 meters. I don't know if the committee has any questions. I think I've outlined it in some detail in my uh, existing letter. Yeah, absolutely. You've gone into to some good detail in the letter and, and the graphics and the pictures help as well. Uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, and one further thing, uh, Kiki, who was uh, from Heritage Trust, she came down and uh, she and the Heritage Trust uh, certainly supported my endeavor because um, over the time uh, period we've had this uh, property, uh, my family has tried to restore it and put back uh, most, if not all of the original structures and, uh, and this particular building will be sort of the last part of the puzzle in terms of putting the original coach house back, which was uh, torn down in approximately 1950. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a very interesting proposal. I think I think anyone could appreciate what you're what you're trying to do. Um, I will I will ask at this point if the committee members have any any further questions of of the applicant. And I see no initial questions uh, but since I have you I will ask if there was any intention at all to I know it's not permitted and, and it's very clearly outlined in the staff report um, but I was wondering if there's any intention to put a, uh, a residential dwelling up in the up in the loft space or or somewhere within this building not not at this particular time no okay just thought I'd ask okay um, Okay, so any further questions from the committee to the applicant? If there's no further questions, I will bring staff back. I'll, I'll provide another opportunity for the committee members to ask questions of staff. Any further questions of staff? Okay, Lee, you're satisfied. Uh, Greg? Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. And there was a um, there was a letter from a uh, local resident that uh, referred to an enclosed map. Um, did they send us? Did they send their own map to us, or were they just commenting that the one that's provided in the agenda was incorrect? For the chair, so they attached the um, map that we had sent out um, for the public notice and kind of marked it up. Um, they were under the impression that a different property was the one subject to the application. However, we clarified with them that it is not. Um, I believe the applicant owns a few properties in the area, so that's where the confusion came from. So they, we clarified with them. All right, thank you. Any further questions of staff from the committee? 
Okay, seeing none. So at this point, uh, I will open the public portion of the meeting. This is the opportunity where members of the public would be able to to join us at the table and and provide comments, concerns. Uh, I'll just note at this time that uh, for this particular application, we have no members of the public who have registered to speak on this application, other than the information that we've already received in our uh, in our agenda package. So I will, uh, or with that being said, I'll formally close the public portion and uh, just go back to the committee and ask if there's any further questions of clarification, uh, either to the applicant or to staff. And if there's no further questions of clarification, I will ask the committee to uh, make a decision. Any members want to throw their hand up to move a motion here? Greg? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move that uh, application A15 stroke 20 um, be approved as, uh, as shown in the agenda. And uh, seeking a seconder, Lee? Any of the committee members have any discussion on that motion for approval? Okay, seeing none, so we will uh, we will have a recorded vote. So again, uh, when the vote is called, raise your hand and keep your hand raised until your name is called. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand until your name is called. Virginia Kershaw, Tara Gaskin, Lee Reiner, Greg Kempa, Dan Namizniak. The motion is approved unanimously on recorded vote. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank members of the uh, uh, committee and uh, hopefully when the project is completed, they'll come and see it. Absolutely, looking forward to it. Okay, the next item on our agenda is a consent application B14-2020 for 149 Albion Street. Is the agent present? Mr. Phillips, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Fred Rossi. The uh, application that's before you tonight uh, has to do with uh, an administrative process to sever a semi into the two units to allow for their uh, sale to two individuals. Um, we've read the planning staff report and uh, are supportive of all the conditions of the approval and uh, we're just seeking the approval of the committee. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, I'll uh, invite staff in and staff will present the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, we've received a consent application for 149 Albion Street. Next slide. The property is situated on the east side of Albion Street, south of St. James Street. The subject lands are designated residential area, low density in the official plan and are zoned residential conversion in zoning bylaw 16090. Next slide. A two-story semi-detached dwelling was recently constructed on the property. This photo is taken from Albion Street. Next slide. The applicant is proposing a severance to separate ownership of each unit of the semi-detached dwelling and all associated yards. Each proposed new lot will have an area of approximately 373 square meters. 
To approve a consent application, the Committee of Adjustment must have regard for Section 5124 of the Planning Act. And this includes criteria such as if the plan conforms to the official plan and the adequacy of utilities and municipal services in the area. Both the severed and the retained parcels will have frontage on the municipal roadway and meet the minimum lot area requirements of the zoning lot law. The creation of the new lot will not restrict development on any adjacent property. And there are actually multiple lots of a very similar shape and size uh, within the immediate vicinity. Next slide. This application was circulated to all property owners within 60 meters and no objections were received. Having regard for section 5124 of the Planning Act, staff are satisf satisfied that the application is desirable and compatible with the surrounding area and will not result in adverse impacts on surrounding properties. Staff recommend that application B14 2020 be approved. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sean. Any questions from the committee to staff? I see no questions. So at this point, I will open the public portion of the, of the meeting for this item. And I'll note that uh, there are no members of the public registered to speak on this item. And with that being said, I will close the public portion and I will ask if the committee members have any further questions of clarification to staff or, or to the applicant or agent. And seeing none, I'll look for a motion for a decision. Lee. Through Ms. Chair, I'll uh, put forward that application B14 slash 2020 be approved subject to conditions attached in Appendix A in the report. Thank you, Lee. Seeking a seconder. Virginia, any members have any points for discussion on this motion? Okay, seeing none, I'll have the clerk call the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand and leave it raised until your name is called. Virginia Kershaw, Tara Gaskin, Lee Reiner, Greg Kempa, Dan Nemesniak. Motion is carried unanimously on a recorded vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda, minor variance application A16 uh, 2020 for 13 Alma Street. Are the applicants owners present? There they are. Welcome. Uh, please unmute, you, mute, unmute yourselves and uh, state your name and addresses for the record. And then the floor is yours to kind of run us through the details of your proposal. Hi there, I'm uh, Cody Eckert. And, uh, Tequila Babia. We're from uh, 13 Alma Street. We're applying for two variances. Um, I'm sure um, you received our cover letter, I hope. Um, so we are uh, applying for one variance to allow the second story of our coach house that exists on the property. It was built in 1930 by the city. And um, we are looking to have that approved um, as it's, uh, it's the whole upper area of the coach house, which is um, about 1500 square feet. And um, there is only one window upstairs um, we provided a picture of the window and which other properties are visible from the window. Um, it's the furthest reaches of uh, our neighboring yards. And um, we asked our neighbors um, if they had any issues with our window. And we have um, gotten letters of no objection from those neighbors to uh, the concerns of privacy for that window. And um, yeah, we're, we're really hoping that we can um, keep our uh, senior disabled tenants uh, still living in that uh, coach house who were the original owners 
or, or the previous owners, I should say, of uh, 13 Elm Street. And the window has also been there for years. It's, as far as we know, the, the and window, never been a concern. The window has existed there since the building was built, um, presumably in the 1930s. Uh, we're also applying for um, to permit a shared area between the entrance to the second dwelling unit and the exterior entrance. Um, the exit is through the garage. Um, we have a garage door that opens to the backyard of our property. So we would like access to be able to use that um, if we need to get any equipment back there or anything like that. Um, so we were going to have fire rated steel doors put in our side that we were able to access through. Um, so we're hoping to have that approved as well. Yes, the, uh, the whole separation of the garage will be um, fireproofed and the doors will be locked at all times other than to move uh, larger equipment into the backyard when needed. Um, but this will still keep a direct uh, exterior entrance for the um, second dwelling in the basement. And um, we believe uh, it will be um, still uh, very safe for the um, It'll comply with all the codes. Yes, yeah, all fire codes, yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions for us. Um, we tried to put everything we could in our questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions from the committee to the applicants? Greg? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I understand that uh, what, um, what the applicant has done is, is tried to find a way to get from the garage to the backyard, hence the double doors, to, to your comment about wanting to, to pass uh, something through. Was there any thought getting to moving uh, Moving that door to the, I'm going to call it the left-hand wall of the diagram I'm looking on, um, thereby giving you a, um, you can have a firm wall across the back of the garage and, and not have this issue. Um, yes, uh, so the, the side of the garage, um, currently there is a small gate at the side of the property. It is not large enough um, to get most uh, larger equipment through. Um, so we do have the, the nine foot wide garage door currently existing, um, which we have moved uh, a larger equipment through, um, like a stump remover and um, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, we're just trying to um, be able to retain that uh, utility while also um, complying with the, uh, the fire code. How much room do you have between the, the garage and the property line? on that side of the house? Um, I don't believe I use, um, I'm gonna say maybe about four feet. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions from the committee to the applicants? Uh, I just have just have one uh, or maybe, maybe a few. Um, how long, historically, how long has that accessory structure been used as a residence in your knowledge? Um, since November of last year. And what was it used uh, for before that? A computer museum. Uh, so they had regular tours once a week and had people go back there and would explore upstairs, and downstairs, game nights kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, it's certainly certainly a type of application that we haven't. I don't believe we've seen uh, at this point. Obviously, the accessory dwelling units uh, is something new uh, that many municipalities are dealing with and trying to figure out how to implement them. Um, every yeah. every municipality is different. Uh, in this case, um, it is it is clear that they're they're not permitted on the second level of a of an accessory structure, and that's that's part of the reason why you're here. Um, obviously, you've seen the staff report with the recommendations where they're recommending approval of that shared common area and refusal of the, um, of the location of the accessory structure. Is there any opportunity to locate the residential portion on, on the lower level? There is like with like limited space. Um, I mean, between like kitchen, dining area, living space. Um, it is just 
more convenient to have that upper level as a bedroom. It would just be as a bedroom, so it wouldn't be a common area where there's tons of people visiting. Um, it would just be used as a bedroom. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's it's the second floor has always existed in that building. Um, same with the window uh, up there, and um, it is just a it's a very large space up there um, to go and use. And we're just really hoping that the um, it's something we can offer to the uh, people of Ramford as a affordable housing option. Absolutely, and just further to to your comments there, it's 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 a the structure exists and it's been there for a long time, and it's certainly it's certainly not something. Uh, that anyone else could easily duplicate. I think it would be a much different situation if someone was looking to create this situation, but you know, this structure exists. You're mm -hmm. trying to utilize the space that is already there. That's definitely. Um, any questions, further questions from the committee before we go to staff? Okay, seeing none, so I'll invite staff to to the table to present the details of the report and the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Chair, members of the committee. Planning staff have received a minor variance application for the lands municipally addressed as 13 Alma Street. Next slide. The property is located on the south side of Alma Street. The lands are designated residential area low density in the city's official plan and zoned residential type 1c zone in the zoning bylaw. Next slide. The applicant has converted their basement and accessory structure into accessory dwelling units with no build without building permits. The applicant is seeking relief from sections two sections of the zoning bylaw in order to legalize the units from a zoning perspective and go forward with the building permit process. Next slide. The first variance is to permit a shared area between the exterior entrance and entrance to the accessory dwelling unit and it is required pursuant to section 2.4.15.1 of the zoning bylaw. Next slide. For committee's information, this variance is to allow the access from the garage to the rear yard through the corridor between the separate exterior entrance and the door to the accessory dwelling unit. This is illustrated on the current slide with the shared area highlighted in blue the exterior door and entrance to the accessory dwelling unit in red, and the garage access to the rear yard illustrated in green. By design, this corridor between the separate exterior door and door to the accessory dwelling unit in the basement becomes a shared area and is not considered separate under the zoning bylaw. The Ontario Building Code does not restrict this, be to this space to be shared, um, but does require the fire separation between the units, including the garage with proper exits from each. Doors are permitted in the area as long as they are fire rated and meet the requirements of the OBC, which is addressed at the building permit review stage. In order for a variance to be approved, a variance must meet the four tests of the section 45.1 of the Planning Act. The variance is minor in nature and is appropriate development and use of the lands as the basement accessory dwelling unit has clearly has a clearly identical exterior um, entrance, which provides direct access to the entrance of the basement unit and does not create unjust impact on the property owner or the tenant. Planning staff are of the opinion that the intent of the zoning bylaw is maintained, as it is evident that the two units are separate and have separate access from each unit and creates a small shared area that will not impact the privacy or the use by each resident. Planning staff are satisfied that the general intent of the official plan is also maintained. Next slide. So this is just an image of that um, rear access door, um, that garage door. Again, this unit and the garage are required to meet the requirements of the OBC, which is again addressed at the building permit stage. Next slide. The the second proposed variance is to allow for an accessory dwelling unit within an accessory structure to be located above the first floor, whereas accessory dwelling units in the accessory structures are not permitted above the first floor. As you can see here, this is an image or a site plan for the accessory um, structure dwelling unit. Um, this main floor has the has area which is um, used for the accessory dwelling unit and then stairs to the second story, which is also 
um, was used for the um, accessory dwelling unit. So the general intent of the purpose of this section of the zoning bylaw is to limit privacy and overlook concerns. Next slide, please. Upon the review of policies and comments from members of the public, planning staff are not supportive of the proposed variance. Planning staff were contacted by residents who were in opposition of this variance due to the overlook and privacy concerns. Planning staff are of the opinion that, this exist, that the existing situation does create overlook onto adjacent properties and impacts the privacy of the neighboring amenity space. In regards to variance two, it is planning staff's opinion that the proposed variance does not meet the intent of the zoning bylaw and is not, not minor in nature, nor desirable, nor desirable for appropriate development and use of the land as it impacts neighboring properties and creates overlook and privacy concerns. Planning staff are, are satisfied that the general intent of the official plan is maintained as the accessory dwelling units are encouraged through the official plan. Planning staff are not supportive of the second variance and are of the opinion that the proposed variance does not meet the four tests of the Planning Act. Next slide. The map, this map illustrates the area of public notification. A notice sign was also placed on the subject lands. Multiple members of the public contacted staff in regards to the proposed minor variance application. A total of four residents contacted staff and two residents provided us with um, letters of opposition which are, were included in the report. The following concerns were voiced by members of the public. The number of dwelling units on the property, appreciation of property values, concerns with permitting the use of a second story, including privacy and overlook concerns, increase in on-street parking, noise and animal complaints, concerns regarding the health and safety of the accessory units. Um, planning staff discussed these concerns with the members of the public and advised that the two accessory dwelling units are permitted under the recent amendment to the zoning bylaw. And, as no, and noted that the required three parking spaces are being provided on the subject property. Planning staff also advised that the units are required to meet the requirements of the Ontario Building Code, including window size, fire separation, and number, of loca number and location of exits, which is again forced through the building permit process. At the time of the application, the applicant had submitted letters of no objection from some neighboring land owners whose lots were visible from the second story window of the accessory building. Between the two letters, there's a single member of the public which had signed both letters received. Unfortunately, planning staff were unable to confirm their opinion with the member of the public. A site visit was conducted on September 22nd. Upon completion and of this visit and review of the applicable policies, planning staff are supportive of variance one, which would permit the shared area between the exterior door and entrance door of the basement accessory dwelling unit. Planning staff are not supportive of variance two respecting the use of the second story for, for the accessory dwelling unit within the accessory structure as it does not meet the intent of the zoning bylaw, is not desirable development and use of the land, nor minor in nature as it has created overlook and privacy concerns. For reasons mentioned above, or for reasons mentioned um, in the report, planning staff recommend that the request for the minor variance for the shared area between the exterior door and entrance to the accessory dwelling unit be approved, and that the request to permit the accessory dwelling unit above the first floor in the accessory structure be refused um, for application A-16-2020. Um, thank you, and I can answer any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Any questions from the committee? to staff. Uh, I just have one. Uh, I'm assuming because it, there's no further variance requests or required for this uh, provision, but I would assume that it meets the size requirements or minimum size requirements for an accessory dwelling. Uh, yes, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Yes, it does. Uh, if you go back to the, sorry, if, if they could go back to the um, slide that illustrated the accessory unit. The um, ground floor of the 
accessory structure is approximately 1,000 square feet in size, which is much um, larger than the, the minimum. Perfect, thank you. Any further questions from the committee to staff? Okay, seeing none. So at this point, uh, I will open the, the meeting uh, to the public. This is the public portion of the meeting. Uh, and I will note that uh, apart from the comments included in the staff report and, and shared by the applicant this evening, uh, no members of the public have uh, formally registered to speak to this item. So with that being said, I will close the public portion of this, uh, of this item. And I will ask if the committee members have any further questions and clarification to staff or to the applicants. Lee. To you, Mr. Chair, I'm just wondering if the applicants could speak to the citizen that provided a letter, both uh, opposing and, and on side for this development. Do they have any knowledge of that? Can they speak to that at all? Hello, can you hear us? Um, I, I am, we are not sure um, who uh, sent in a letter. Uh, we went around previously um, before application and um, got signed letters of no objection for everyone that was in view of that window, um, which has, like I said, once again, it's always, the window has always been there. And um, yeah, I am not sure who has, a, like there is multiple triplexes around us that have, that are two stories and there's two story houses. And um, I don't know uh, why they have concern with uh, this accessory building um, window that's always been there. And there's also a chain link fence all around the property. Um, so all of our neighbors first floor privacy would be impacted regardless. Is that helpful, Lee? Just, uh, just running through a couple of the concerns and perhaps you can, you can uh, just kind of uh, provide a response for each. Can you just outline how parking will work and how uh, you anticipate garbage collection will work? Yes, so we have um, parking available for six cars in our driveway and two in the garage. So we have, uh, I believe, ample parking. Um, and uh, as far as garbage collection goes, I assume with any um, duplex or triplex, there will be a slight increase uh, in garbage at the curb, um, which uh, I assume is just normal for these uh, types of properties that will have to be collected as um, there is more people living there. As well, the parking is three car lengths long, so it would be an individual spot for each person with two spots, like a spot behind them as well. As well, on street parking, there's no parking objections all year round for street parking. So there's multiple street parking, probably about almost two and a half car lengths in front of our property alone. Okay, that's good. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, any further questions from the committee? Virginia? Yes, I just wanted clarification. The letter of objection notes that um, until recently, there were no windows on the second floor, but the present occupants on the main floor recently installed a window in the cast wall. Yet the applicants have said that the, wall, the window has been there all along. Can you confirm that? Yes, the window has been there all along. There is actually photos of the window there on the Brantford Computer Museum website. Decades ago. So we have just replaced the existing window that was there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions of clarification, I'll just ask if the committee is prepared to make a decision. or at least uh, put a motion on the floor. Again, we have, we have uh, 
It's one minor variance application, two parts. Uh, the staff report is recommending approval of the shared common area and refusal of the location of the accessory uh, dwelling unit being in the second second story. So we'll be looking for a motion uh, that speaks to both. Virginia. Well, just to get it on the floor, I'll move that um, variance one for application A16-2020 uh, regarding the common area be approved and variance two for A16-2020 for the accessory structure be refused as noted in the agenda. Okay, do I have a seconder for that motion before we discuss? Greg, seconder of that motion? Okay, any members wish to speak to the motion? Okay, I'll provide some comments then. Uh, so as, as it's mentioned in the report, um, the, the bylaws have been revised to, or at least modified or introducing additional permissions for these uh, secondary dwelling units, um, which is a response to Bill 108, which is the provincial legislation. So all municipalities are, are kind of being encouraged to, to look at different ways to accommodate different types, different housing types, um, providing or housing or dwelling units in an accessory structure is nothing new in other places. Um, it's, it's certainly something new here. Um, all, all departments are, are certainly adjusting to the idea uh, and that includes building uh, and, and planning as well. Um, building is obviously tasked with the, the idea of having to make these buildings safe for, for, uh, for occupancy. Uh, that includes services, firewalls, you know, the residents have spoken in great detail to, to what they have done and what they will have to do to make these buildings or this building, this structure um, safe to accommodate the dwelling. Uh, the in terms of the location, uh, as I mentioned earlier towards the beginning, I, I think that uh, if someone was proposing a, a second story to a, an ex uh, to a new structure that's a little bit different because the, the nuisance doesn't, doesn't necessarily exist. However, today the structure exists, it's been there for a long time. The window has existed for a long time. There's always been the ability to look out that window. So, um, you know, I, I truly feel that the nuisance, uh, the nuisance already exists and the impact, um, the impact is, is already there, which is, which is a minor impact. So, um, I personally uh, will not be supporting this motion for those reasons. Uh, I feel like this is a great opportunity to introduce these types of uh, dwelling units to to an area that is that is appropriate, and uh, so that's that's how I'll be voting tonight. So I I would uh, I would be not supporting this motion. Any other members have any comments on the motion, Lee? Excuse me, Mr. Chair, my comment um, with respect to the motion and, and something that you spoke to, uh, the dwelling, the dwelling, I should say, the structure has been there um, for quite some time. I think the concern comes around the fact that there hasn't been people previously residing in it. Um, it's been a museum, as the applicant stated. Uh, it's had other uses, a garage, all, all kinds of different uses. Um, there hasn't been somebody actually living in it. So based on the concerns of the residents, um, I can see that having someone residing there full time, I, I can see potentially them having some issues while I recognize the intent of, of infill developments and, and types of things like that. Um, uh, pe people in the area do have concerns. And then for that reason, I, uh, I, would, I would vote for the, the motion as sits on the floor. Thank you, Lee. Any further comments from the committee? Yeah. 
Uh, do we have any further comments from staff? Clarification? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the comment, the um, request for the variance is for the use of the second story. The, the use, like the accessory dwelling unit is permitted in the accessory structure. So that would be continued to be permitted. However, the second story is what staff um, spoke to in the report and is um, what the variance is for. So that accessory dwelling unit and the thir three units total are, are permitted and would be continued to be permitted under the zoning. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any further comments, Greg? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sensing that we might uh, we might get a split on two different uh, two different items here, and I'm wondering, from a logistics point of view, do we need to deal with these as two separate items? So I guess what I'm saying is, Virginia, would it be a um, um, would it be appropriate then to uh, to amend uh, the motion on the floor to be two separate motions and vote on them as separate items? Uh, through the chair, this is Julia Sipple, uh, the clerk for the meeting. In regards to this, the way that the motion is and currently is on the floor, um, you can split the vote um, on the items themselves. So it looks like based on the way the report is drafted, you'd be looking at voting on clause A at the same time as clause C, and then pairing together B and D. Um, on the motion, I can share the motion again for you guys. Um, and then that way, what would be happening is you'd be voting on one variance uh, itself and then the other variance itself. And the committee does have the ability to do that if you request a separate vote on the variances. Greg, are you proposing that we vote separately on each item? I am, Mr. Chair. Okay. Do the committee members see that as a friendly amendment to the motion? It's not even an amendment. What are we calling it? Just splitting the vote. Valid request. Any objections to the splitting of the vote? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, any further questions, comments on the motion? everybody clear on what we are voting for so the motion again to remind everyone uh the motion on the floor is exactly as it's laid out in the staff report um, approval for the shared common area and refusal for the um, the ability for that accessory dwelling unit to extend into the second level uh, we'll be calling two votes uh, the clerk three votes says the clerk the clerk will clarify before she calls the vote <laughs> So through the chair, just in regards to this, so you'll be doing a vote on clause A and C, and a separate vote on clause B and D, and there's still the remaining clause of E because regardless of either motion, that would need to be put in as a, in the notice. So we'll do, we would do a separate vote on E just out of the requirement itself. In case one of them fails, we don't wanna fail clause E at the same time, so. Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if this presents a problem, but having seconded the motion and find myself having a bit of a change of heart on how I might vote on the second item, should I be withdrawing my second for the motion as shown in the minutes? Julia? Through the chair. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure if uh, our chair was going to respond to that. Uh, no, a mover and a seconder is not tied to how you vote. It's for purposes of placing an item on the floor for debate. Thank so you. through debate, if you have a change of heart, that is completely fine. Thank you. Okay, let's call the vote. 
All those in favor of clauses A and C, which is the approval of variance one for the reasons noted under clause C, please raise your hand and leave it raised until you hear your name called. Virginia Kershaw, Tara Gaskin, Uli Reiner, Greg Kempa, Dan Namizniak. So clauses A and C are approved. And all those in favor of clauses B and D, so that is the um, refusal of variance two and uh, the reasons noted in the report, please raise your hand and leave it raised until you hear your name called. Virginia, Lee, all those against the refusal uh, of B and D, please raise your hands and leave it raised until your name is called. Tara, Greg Kempa, Dan Namizniak. So clauses B and D, the refusal has failed on a recorded vote of three to two. Um, in regards to this one, from a procedural standpoint, by virtue of failing, the motion does not mean it is approved. A secondary motion would need to be placed on the floor to approve the item for the for specific reasons, which would also need to be noted. Um, and I would suggest dealing with that prior to dealing with E. Okay, so at this point, I'll be looking for a new motion to be placed on the floor uh, to be voting on B and D. And again, I'll need a, a reason for the motion. Um, and perhaps you could look to D to help guide some wording. Greg? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna suggest that I, I read it verbatim and just with just a couple of word changes. And that would be that application A16 stroke 2020, requesting relief from section 6.32.8 of zoning bylaw 160-90 variance two, to permit an accessory dwelling unit above the first floor of an accession accessory structure and whereas accessory dwelling units are not permitted above the first floor can an accessory structure be approved and that the reason for this approval is that the, the variance is, is in fact minor in nature and desirable for the development of the land Perfect. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Tara, any discussion on this motion? Virginia? I just had a question, maybe I missed it in the report, but the first floor of this accessory structure, what's happening with it right now? Are you using it for another tenant storage or what's happening or what's your plans in the future for? Yeah, I'll, I'll allow the uh, the applicants to respond. Yes, uh, so currently it is the living room and kitchen area of our elderly disabled tenants that were the previous owners that we were friends with um, when we bought the property and they didn't have anywhere else to go when we bought the property from them. And um, we wanted them to stay with us on the property that they've been on for a long time. They've become our family. Virginia? So they're on the first floor? It's, the first floor and the second as a bedroom. Yes, there's the living room, kitchen downstairs and the bedroom upstairs. There's no way to accommodate a bedroom downstairs, especially if they're disabled, as you say. How are they getting up to the second floor? Their disabilities may not be motor, but they do have disabilities. Um, just spacing wise, there's limited space to have 
um, a couch in there, dining room, um, so have a kitchen table. It's just limited for space. The, down, the downstairs would need major renovations to um, construct any sort of bedroom um, down here. Um, I don't uh, see how it's really possible with the current layout. Okay, thank you. So I had Greg moving the motion and the seconder was Tara. Excellent. Any further comments on the motion? Seeing none, we will call the vote and I'll have the clerk uh, again, just remind us what we're voting for. Uh, so the motion that's placed on the floor before you is to approve variance two for the second story portion of the accessory dwelling. Uh, and that the reason for the approval, it is in keeping with the general intent and zoning bylaw and is minor in nature and desirable for appropriate development. So all those in favor, please raise your hand and leave it raised until you hear your name called. Tara Gaskin, Greg Kempa, Dan Nemesniak. All those against, please raise your hand and keep it raised until your name is called. Virginia Kershaw, Lee Reiner. Variance two, uh, clauses A and D is approved on a recorded vote of three to two. And if the chair is permitting, um, we can go to vote for clause E. Let's vote for clause E. All those in favor of clause E, which is to include the uh, portion uh, in the notice of decision, please raise your hand and leave it raised until your name is called. Virginia Kershaw. Tara Gaskin, Lee Reiner, Greg Kempa, Dan Nemesniak. Clause E is approved unanimously on a recorded vote. Okay, thank you very much for your time and your information. We will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, consent and minor variance application B12-2020 and A18-2020 for 38 Golfdale Road. Is the applicant or agent present? Ted is here. Welcome, Ted. I will uh, turn the floor over to you before I do. I see you've unmuted yourself. Perfect. Uh, just introduce yourself, your address, and provide us with the details of your proposal. Excellent. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and community members. Uh, my name is Ted Tokars. I am the agent for my wife, Susan Tokars, and our address is 38 Golfdale Road. Our application for a consent and minor variance is to create a lot on the northern portion of the property. Uh, the relief would allow a minimum lot width of 22.23 uh, meters, or as 24.5 meters is required. I would like to add uh, another thing here too, is that the, um, the minimum lot uh, uh, area is uh, the required is 745 square meters, and the proposed sever lot will actually be 761 square meters. Our application does meet the, uh, the tests of the Planning Act and the boundary adjustment will have no adverse impact on the surrounding properties. Uh, we understand and agree to the conditions set forth uh, in the conditions of the consent. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ted. Do I have any questions from the committee to the applicant? Okay. Seeing none, I will ask staff to join us to present the staff recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. We've received a consent and minor variance application for 38 Golfdale Road. Next slide. The property is located on Golfdale Road, north of Stymie Boulevard, and has an area of approximately 2,000 square meters. The subject lands are designated residential area, low density in the city's official plan and zoned R1A2 in the zoning bylaw. Next slide. The lands are occupied by a single detached 
dwelling with an attached garage and accessory structure. Uh, this picture was taken from Golfdale Road and would be the retained lands if the application is approved. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture also taken from Golfdale and these, this part of the property uh, would, would be the severed lands if the application is approved. Next slide. So the applicant is proposing here to sever one new lot and retain the existing dwelling and remnant land the existing garage and shed are proposed to be demolished to facilitate the severance application. As well, the, to facilitate the severance, um, a minor variance is required to permit a minimum lot width of 22.3 meters, whereas, 24, whereas a minimum lot width of 24.5 meters is required. The severed lands will have a lot area of 763 square meters and the retains an area of 1,240 square meters. To approve a consent application, the Committee of Adjustment must have regard for Section 5124 of the Planning Act. These criteria include if the plan conforms to the official plan and the adequacy of utilities and municipal services. Both the severed and the retained parcels will have frontage on a municipal roadway and meet the minimum lot area requirements of the zoning bylaw as the applicant had previously alluded to. The creation of the new lot will not restrict development on any adjacent property. To facilitate the development as proposed, the applicant requires a variance to lot width to permit 22.23 meters. For this, we approve it must satisfy the four tests of the Planning Act. In staff's opinion, the proposed variance is minor in nature as it is not expected to have adverse impacts on neighboring properties. It's desirable and appropriate for the development of the land as it will not restrict development on adjacent property. It meets the, the minor variance meets the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw and official plan as it will result in a lot that will appropriately accommodate a single detached dwelling and is in keeping with the existing character of the neighborhood. There are multiple lots in the immediate vicinity with similar or lesser lot widths, including those that have been created through the consent and minor variance application process. The proposed retained and severed lands will satisfy the minimum lot area requirement of the R1A2 zone. Next slide. The, applicant, the application was circulated to all property owners within a 60 meter radius and one letter of support was received. I wasn't able to circulate this letter to the committee before this meeting, so I'm just going to read it word for word uh, right now. The, the nearby resident writes, regarding the application for adjustment to this property of 38 Golfdale Road, Brantford, Ontario, we are in support of this request for severance, allowing for the minor variance. We do not see it as detrimental to the neighborhood and would only further add value to the surrounding properties. There are a few newer homes built in the neighborhood on smaller lots that demonstrate compatibility to the existing houses. This is in keeping with the evolution of the neighborhood over the last 17 years. It is also in line with the current changes made throughout the city of Brantford and the surrounding area. It also mitigates it also meets the criteria as mandated by the province of Ontario to accommodate residential backfill to mitigate urban sprawl. Uh, that, that was a letter in support I received of the application that came in today. Um, we also received notice from an adjacent resident that they wish to participate in this meeting and I believe they will be speaking after myself. In conclusion, having regard for section 5124 and section 45 of the Planning Act, staff recommend that applications B12-2020 and A18-2020 be approved. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sean. Any questions from the committee to staff? I see no questions. So at this point, I will uh, formally open the public portion of the meeting and this evening for this application I do have uh, one registered 
or two registered uh, members of the public who wish to speak, they are together. Um, are they with us? There they are. Welcome. Thank you. Now is your, your opportunity to, to speak to this application. I'll just have you introduce yourself um, and anyone that's there with you and your address, and then the floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Adrian Pinenberg. I'm here with my wife, uh, Barb. Um, we reside at 57 Golfdale Road, very, fairly close to, uh, uh, to Ted and, and his wife. Um, and I want to start by saying we don't have any uh, opposition to the application. We just really have two questions uh, for, uh, for Mr. Howes. Uh, the first is that uh, it was our understanding because lot 22, which is the, the property immediately behind uh, the property in question uh, was severed just a few years ago. And it was our understanding uh, that construction on those lots couldn't proceed because the infrastructure in the neighborhood had been tapped out, at least for the time being. So the, the, my question is just one of clarification. Is, in fact, is that in fact the case? Or did we just get this information incorrectly? Yeah, we can have uh, staff make note and provide the response. Did you have any anything else? The, the second question was really just a, a question as to whether or not there were plans to sever um, the, the, the property where the house would remain. Uh, it, it appears as if the area uh, to the right of the house uh, could, could possibly qualify as an additional severance. And I just wanted to want, to ask the question if there were any plans for severance in the future. Okay, good questions. Uh, we'll have staff respond first. I do, I do remember uh, that application at 22 Gulf Road. It did come to the committee and was delayed or at least deferred for some time for that exact reason. And then it did come back to the committee. So I'll have staff respond to the infrastructure uh, capacity. And when staff is done, I'll call with Pran Ted. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, to the residents, I can I can give you an update on the uh, infrastructure capacity concerns. It was relating to um, sanitary capacity. Um, the the um, the plant that was having issues handling um, that that capacity has since been upgraded. Um, so you know, we've had notice from our engineering department that, you know, that part of this part of Brantford can now accommodate uh, future development. Um, one thing that they're, they're now having uh, planning applicants do is fill out a, a wastewater allocation uh, request form. And they use that to assess if um, there is capacity, to get capacity in the area uh, for these proposals. And they've confirmed that this is the case as the the pumping station has since been upgraded. And I, I'll defer to the applicant um, for the question regarding the, the remainder of his property. Ted, would you like to respond to? Uh, uh, yes, the actually, I'd like then? to um, address Adrian's question. Um, Yes, uh, approximately two years ago, uh, we did approach planning and that was our, our primary choice with that. We like to sever that part of the property, but it's too small. It would need three variances. So uh, we abandoned that and uh, looked at this option here. So I can say that there will be no, no severance on that side. What were the three uh, variances required? Well, it, it actually boiled down that we needed a boundary adjustment. That's the only way we could do it with, with one of the neighbors, but that wasn't feasible. It was, um, I, I really don't recall what it was. It was the depth, the, uh, it was the depth and the width. The property was just, it was just too small. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Ted. One further question: What is? Uh, I see you're removing the driveway, the the attached garage, and the shed. Uh, what are your plans for? Uh, to are you 
what are your plans to replace those structures on the on the other side or what where's the location sure. of the driveway going to be okay you'll have to okay yeah our plans are the uh, the driveway has to be demolished uh, there is a shed on the other side and it's not really a shed it's more of a garden um, a, a garden house a garden cottage so our intentions are to move that over to the other side and um, dependent on whether the um, uh, the building department will allow us to do that the driveway will also be on the other side the existing driveway will be removed and uh, a, a separate walkway a, a new walkway will uh, proceed around to the um, the south side that uh, our neighbor was just talking about Okay. And, and then, uh, sorry, go ahead. And, and we have no intentions of moving. <laughs> okay. That was, that was going to be my next question. Uh, are you, were you going to develop the lot yourself or sell it off to a future builder? Uh, we really don't know. We, we do have an interested party. Um, but we really don't know. Uh, it's been a, a stress test getting this far. So we have, a, we have a year to decide what we want to do. And like I say, we have someone that uh, we have been working with uh, closely that um, he doesn't want to do anything with a property, but that's, that's about all I can, I, I'd like to share at this moment. Yep, no problem. I just, uh, I just thought I'd ask because obviously the area is very unique. The homes, uh, each home is different. The properties are are uh, beautifully manicured and it's important that whatever goes on that in that space fits contributes positive uh, characteristics to the existing area okay uh, so we've had the residents uh, that were registered speak I'll, I'll note that there were no further registers uh, members of the public wishing to speak to this application or, or these applications so I will formally close the um, the public portion of this application and i'll ask if the committee members have any further questions of clarification to staff or the applicant okay and seeing none i will ask for a motion from a member of the committee greg Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move that uh, applications be 12 uh, stroke 2020 and A18 2020 uh, be approved in both cases subject to um, uh, conditions appendix A um, as shown in the minutes. Great. Seconder? Lee? Do I have any discussion on that motion? The motion is exactly as outlined in our agenda. No further discussion. I'll have the clerk call the vote. All those in favor in the mo of the motion, please raise your hand and leave it raised until your name is called. Virginia Kershaw, Kara Gaskin, Lee Reiner, Greg Kempa, Dan Namizniak. The item has carried unanimously on a recorded vote. Thank you, Ted. Uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda is consent application B13-2020. Our applicant is present. Mr. Vance, welcome. Hi there. I'm sure if you've been listening all in the evening, you know the drill. Yep. Your name, address, and the floor is yours. Great. Thanks a lot. Eddie Vance uh, from Watchers Folden, acting as agent 
for Regender Gill in relation to this application. Um, pretty straightforward here, just looking to correct an inadvertence in registration, just to legally separate the properties. Um, as they are on a crescent, they abut each other at the rear. And I, as you can see in the, in the pictures, I think what's happened, um, own the same properties in the same name, had a little issue, right? That's all we're, we're looking to do is correct and get this back back as separate parcels. I do have a question um, with respect to the conditions um, as listed in Appendix A. I don't know if you want me to ask that now or wait. Now is perfect. Perfect. So number one, uh, receipt of a registered reference plan showing the subject properties. I'm assuming that condition is really already satisfied because we can rely on the other plans. We don't need a new reference plan, do we? I'll, uh, I'll ask staff to provide a response to that one. Um, if there's an existing reference plan that can be used, I'm sure that will satisfy that condition. Uh, I would imagine we would just leave the wording in there and if you can satisfy it with the existing plan, then that's easily done. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll just have staff take notes and I'll try to answer what I can. <laughs> you have any other questions? Absolutely nothing. That was it? Okay. So do I have any questions from the committee to the applicant or agent? Seeing none, we'll have staff uh, join us at the table to present the, the report and perhaps speak to your question about condition number one. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two members of the committee, uh, we've received this consent application B13-2020 for 33 and 77 White Owl Crescent. Next slide, please. So as Mr. Vance noted, the lots um, abut each other to the rear as they are on a crescent um, and have inadvertently merged as they were in the same ownership. Um, they are designated residential area low density in the official plan and zoned residential type two zone in zoning bylaw 16090. The property at 33 White Owl is located on the north side of the street and 77 is on the south side, both on the interior of the Crescent. White Owl Crescent is made up of semi-detached dwellings and to the north, south, west and east are residential streets made up of single and semi-detached dwellings. Next slide, please. So these are the reference plans that, of course, already exist due to the lots having been created um, in the past and inadvertently merged. And to respond to Mr. Vance's question, um, if the these reference plans, they should suffice. Um, however, we recommend leaving that condition in um, just to cover it off. This would most likely I, they'll be fine. It's just easier to leave it in. Just um, it would be easy to clear. Um, it would be very easy to clear with these these reference plans. Next slide. Um, so the application was circulated to all appropriate departments and agencies, and no adverse comments were received. And notice of the public hearing was issued by personal mail and by posting a sign on the site. If you go to two slides from now, I believe. Thank you. Um, at the date of preparation of this report, as well as the date of this hearing, no comments had been received from the public. In terms of whether the consent is appropriate, section 18.9.2 of the official plan also lists criteria for consent applications, including if a severance is a for the purpose of infilling, if no extension or improvement of municipal services is required, and if the lot will have frontage on a public road. The proposed lots have the same dimensions as the majority of lots along White Owl Crescent and are therefore consistent with the existing neighborhood. There will be no visual, vis, visual changes with the existing lots as a result of this consent, and no development is proposed. The intent of the application is simply to separate ownership of what already functions as two separate lots. Planning staff are of the opinion that the subject consent application is consistent with section 5124 of the Planning Act and conforms to the official plan and therefore should be approved subject to the attached conditions in Appendix A. 
Thank you very much. Any questions from the committee to staff? Okay, seeing none, I'll go to the public portion. I will formally open the public portion of this meeting and confirm that there have been no members of the public who have registered to speak on this item. So with that being said, formally close the public portion. I'll ask the committee members if they have any further questions of clarification. Seeing none, Mr. Vance, you heard the response on the condition number one, satisfied? Okay, uh, I will ask if I can get a mover for a motion. Virginia. I'll move that application B13-2020 to sever 33 and 77 White Owl Crescent into two separate lots be approved uh, with conditions in Appendix A as noted in our agenda. Thank you, seeking a seconder. Lee, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, we'll have the clerk call the vote. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand and leave it raised until your name is called. Virginia Kershaw, Tara Gaskin, Lee Reiner, Greg Kempa, Dan Namizniak. The motion is approved unanimously on a recorded vote. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes all of the public hearings for this meeting. Uh, we'll move on to a couple of remainder items, uh, items for consideration. There are no items for consideration, consent items. We're looking for approval of the previous meetings minutes from August 13th, 2020. Greg and the seconder, Lee. Any errors or omissions from those minutes? Seeing none, I will call the vote. Is this a recorded vote? Every month I ask. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Success. Okay, that concludes the items. I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair, Greg, before we adjourn, did we ever hear from um, what's his name? The, the the fellow that went radio silent on us. Oh, our, our missing member. Yes. Any updates on vacancies or um, connecting to our missing member? Where's Waldo? <laughs> Through the chair, uh, the the motion that was carried, a letter went out um, declaring the position vacant uh, to Mr. Savard himself. Unfortunately, no response whatsoever uh, from him. So the position is vacant and currently the clerk's department is undertaking applications uh, and it is posted, the position is posted until October 15th with hopes to have it filled uh, by end of November. So uh, hopefully by the December meeting, we'll have a new member. Thank well, you. allow me to take this opportunity for those watching at home. If this is something you want to be involved in, you want to sit on this committee making these difficult at times decisions, please get your applications in and, uh, and we'd love to have you. That was a free advertisement. There you go. Um, awesome. Anything else the committee would like to share? Questions, staff, updates? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the LPAT has provided a decision based for the 395 Park Road North um, application, which Committee of Adjustment had refused on a tied vote. The appeal was allowed and the invariances from the section of the zoning bylaw were, were permitted. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's if there's nothing else, clerk has another update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one thing is that uh, this is likely going to be my last meeting clerking this committee. Um, Emma Vokes from the clerk's office uh, will be taking over clerking responsibilities for this committee. 
I will be following her around for the next couple of months. So you'll probably still hear and see from me, but uh, she will be your clerk uh, moving forward. So um, she is here. She just didn't turn her camera on, but um, this will be your new clerk, Emma Vokes. Um, and moving forwards, um, she'll be helping you guys out. Okay, perfect. I guess I guess I have to say thank you for all your hard work then. Uh, it's not easy doing what you do for sure. There's a lot of coordinating, a lot of moving parts leading up to any committee meeting. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I think, I think we're in good hands. I've seen, I've seen Emma, uh, preparing and getting us ready for, for these meetings for the last two meetings at least. And, uh, I think, I think we're in good hands for sure. Just as long as she's able to answer those tough questions, procedural stuff. That's the hard part. I have all my faith in her. <laughs> um, Okay, so more changes. That's okay, changes are good. Uh, any, anything else from the committee? Okay, perfect. It looks like we've got a little bit of daylight left, so take this opportunity to get outside, stretch those legs, stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you next month.